If you've given diet, lifestyle, and environmental factors a good, honest, earnest try, and you're not at the health you want to be. So let's say you are eating fatty meats with sufficient fat and calories to support your thyroid function and metabolism, and you are taking iodine to support the thyroid function, and you are trying to balance sleep, getting enough sun for vitamin D and for cholesterol, and you are doing some levels of movement, strength training, and cardiovascular health for heart health, and your health is not moving enough in the right direction. You're still suffering from brain fog and fatigue. And now you are wondering if you should possibly get on bioidentical hormones or exogenous hormones. This conversation is for you. Hey guys, my name is Judy Cho and I'm board certified in holistic nutrition. And I have a private practice where we've worked with over 2000 carnivore clients and patients, helping them get to root cause healing. And we often start with the carnivore cures, all meat elimination diet. Today, the pleasure of sitting down with coach Zane Giggs. He is the author of kicking butt after 50. Sorry, I have to change the verbiage, but in our conversation, we talk about all things health as you are aging and aging gracefully. He talks through what happens as your hormones start going down. And one of the risk factors of that is your age. We talk about the importance of managing your diet and lifestyle, your exercise, your movement, getting enough sleep. And then beyond that, if things aren't improving, because as you age, your hormones will go down anyway. But if you feel low mood and low energy and brain fog, and you're just not able to balance that well, we get into a conversation of whether or not bioidentical should be on the table for discussion. He shares a lot of good points as to why it may be beneficial in thinking about the risk versus reward equation when you are making that decision. There is no answer for each individual person. I wish there was. I wish that everyone should do X and then therefore you will get Y. I wish it was that easy, but it really is not. And I hope that this conversation, if anything, our goal is to make you think, make you decide in your own journey and being honest with your own wellness journey and then figuring out what your next step should be. I hope that this conversation allows you to think and process and figure out is bioidentical hormones the right move for you? And if you should, what should you be taking? We also talk about exercise, diet, the importance of sleep. We talk about our sex lives. These are a lot of important things that we discuss in this conversation. Before we get into this interview, please make sure to like and subscribe and hit that notification bell because that allows us to get our content out to more people. Thank you so much. And let's get right into the interview. Hi, Zane. Thank you so much for joining me today. I'm excited to get to know you more and also get the community to get to know you more. So if you can introduce yourself for the people that may not have heard of you. Okay. Thank you, Judy. I appreciate you having me on. Uh, We met, what, it's been a year, a little over a year ago at uh, Hack Your Health or KetoCon uh, at Dr. Barry's house. I'm St. Greg's, as you said, I'm, I've been a fitness trainer for about 26 years, since oh. 1998. And so I've been in the space a while, uh, just trying to learn my way through a lot before we had internet, before we had social media, and just a lot of trial and error, a lot of reading and, and talking to other people and found my way into the low carb space because uh, what the standard kind of recommendations just weren't working for my, my weight loss clients. And progressed from there into working using uh, tools like intermittent fasting, fasted workouts, and then found that as I got older, even those had to be modified a bit to adjust for age and stress and stress hormones. So really trying to take, uh, I learned rather than trying to kind of put a, a one size fits all on everybody, I'm, I'm really getting very strategic with my clients to seeing sometimes those those work well. And if they don't, here's, we, we, we adjust. And so I've just through the years, learn to, uh, after with a lot of trial and error, again, figure out how to use certain tools for the right person and what gets them from A to B may not get them from B to C. What gets them through one point of their journey may not always be what they always need to do for the next part of their journey. And so that's that's kind of where I am now with a lot of clients that are 45, 50 and older. It's like, as they get older, they still want to stay fit and modify, you know, make certain modifications to what worked before their, their whole goal, I, I try to keep the end in mind, which is to keep performing at a high level. And so it's to help those people keep performing at a high level is really the goal more, more so than, uh, than, than sticking with something that, that worked in the past. If you were to pick maybe three tips or three levers that you use to help people that you've seen, generally speaking, 
you may see certain people after the age of 50 or 45 that they start struggling with X. I'm guessing one is hormones, but um, what is that? And then what levers do you normally pull that you've seen benefits? So, I mean, I think the big one is with weight gain that was used to not be so hard to, you know, keep off or to, yes. to, to get rid of. If they let it come on, they could take it off pretty quickly. And then as you get older, it's like, oh, that doesn't work quite as quickly. And so I think you have to begin with cleaning up their diet. I'm a, I'm a big proponent of getting rid of highly processed food or ultra processed food. I think uh, we've un we underestimated the impact of of the processed oils that are in so many of them for so long. And I'm realizing more and more that we have probably over the last five years that we really have to get these out of the diet in order to allow our body to make energy properly. Mm -hmm. And that has a downstream effect on blood sugar and weight gain and insulin sensitivity. And so to restore insulin sensitivity uh, and, and, and a proper fat burning energy metabolism, We've got to get rid of these ultra processed food and stick to whatever they're eating. It's got to be a whole food diet. They don't always eat exactly what I want them to eat or they have things they don't want to get. But but the getting rid of the processed food and sticking to whole food with a priority on animal protein at the center of that, not so much protein supplements, but protein in whole mm -hmm. food, whole cuts of protein uh, as a center with whole food around it, whatever else that that seems to fit is priority for fixing that because mm -hmm. it's just their body just isn't adjusting. And then definitely getting blood work and looking at uh, where the hormones are. Sometimes those can be adjusted. They're usually, if they're under 45, it's a little bit easier to adjust some of that with, with diet. Over 45, you're going to need both. Um, many, many require in order to bring hormone levels up to a, a real, like I, I, again, I'm looking at people who are, are trying to keep pushing the, pushing the lever, you know, at a high level, you know, trying to keep, keep, you know, a lot of leverage on their energy and their career. And so they may opt for a bioidentical hormone replacement, but I always tell them, don't use this as a crutch. Don't use this as a tool to allow you to eat poorly or to keep consuming too much alcohol. When we have to get, we can't chase the spider with, or, you know, chase the fly with a spider, right? We can't try to over leverage a one tool because we don't want to fix something else that's so obvious as like our diet or alcohol consumption. And so you got to clean up the diet and, and reduce or eliminate alcohol to really fix the original problem, or you're just going to have really end up with a lot of uh, water retention. You don't have a lot of change. They may feel better for a little while, but you don't really change the problem. And so trying to get them to equate or line up their lifestyle habits with the markers on their blood work that, that they want to change. So if they have higher triglycerides or their fasting insulin is, 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 is out of range, right? The, trying to help them see that their lifestyle habits that they do consistently day after day after day is what's really going to impact that, not some quick fix. And so diet, exercise, and sleep being the foundation being like what they build everything on, get those straight. And then whatever they layer on top of that or extra tools that help as a, you know, accelerator to that or that help them feel better and, and have the energy to maybe, uh, you know, put those lifestyle habits in place or, or just see a little more benefit from those habits, but they aren't replacement for that foundation. And so it's really setting up that foundation of cleaning up the diet with animal protein at the center and whole food around that regular exercise. So strength training is ideal for people as they're getting older to hold on to muscle mass, keep the hormones solid, insulin sensitivity at the muscle, uh, and then and some other movement activity, something hopefully something they enjoy, but just get moving uh, in addition to that several days a week, right? We gotta have movement and then pay attention to the quality of their sleep because we know what, what they do during the day impacts the quality, quality of their sleep at night. So getting you know, getting outside, getting some walks and getting some sunlight during the day, uh, avoiding the screen time and late meals and drinking late, which which would all have a negative impact on sleep. And then honoring their sleep schedule, going to bed at a decent time, not getting caught in the Netflix cycle that's keeping them up late and killing their opportunities to get some good deep sleep, which is so restorative. And so it's it it starts with that foundation. Okay. That's a long way to be saying start with the foundation, diet, exercise, sleep. Then we layer on the other things that, that can sometimes give them a little extra leverage. So let's say someone was eating a carnivore diet. Maybe they lost okay. a little bit of weight. They're balanced, or maybe they're eating just meat based. So there's like a little bit of keto treats, but they're eating low carb. They feel a lot better, but not they're They still have that 
few pounds, or maybe it's 20 pounds that they still cannot lose. Then they mm-hmm. add in a little bit of exercise. Maybe it's not every day, but they're still exercising, mm-hmm. maybe hit training, maybe lifting a little bit, but nothing crazy amount, just a moderate amount of exercise that the average person may do or may not do actually, but, but right, still, right. like assuming that they do that and then their sleep is okay. Maybe they wake up one or two times, but overall they're getting six to eight hours and then they still have that stubborn weight. Uh, maybe it's anywhere between 20 to 50 pounds. Yeah, their hormones probably not as ideal as we have in the optimal ranges. Mm. What do we do there? Do we, because I know in the carnivore space, there's a whole subset of people that are like fast. The answer is fasting. And I don't know Mm. if that's always the answer, but I'm curious your thoughts. What would you, what would you do? I know it's very individualized again, but in that scenario. Yeah, that's a tough one to see, to think about what would be standing in the way sometimes it's just time and consistency over time it's like sticking with it and letting their bodies you know look i'd have to look at their blood work if the fasting insulin was still high, i would say well that's that's we're gonna have to be consistent that's enough fair. to let the fasting insulin come down you know and if their blood sugars uh or or might be normal but they might have a high fasting insulin well that's that's that insulin is 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 trying to keep it under control but and, and unfortunately a lot of doctors don't look at that so i'd get a, get eyes on fasting insulin minimum um, and, and the, you know, the hormone levels, let's say they're, 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 they're okay, but what does cortisol look like? What, what's your stress like, you know, what's your stress level? Because cortisol can play a role in hanging on to a little bit of fat. And if so, we can find some way to maybe, re- you know, bring that down in the evening. Uh, I would again, look at alcohol consumption, uh, maybe some sort of, uh, you know, something that they can do that, that it's away from work that brings their mind quiets their mind kind of lands the plane so to speak before going to bed but i i would i would really um it would have to be i say look really closely at their diet to see what might be sneaking in that they're not aware of okay uh and get really granular with that because it's it's usually there's usually something they're underestimating Mm -hmm. that is sneaking in there if the hormones are good it, or, or th- including thyroid, if thyroid it's lines up, testosterone's good, the other hormones are, are okay, then there's something sneaking in there that they're underestimating have an impact. And not. And some people get away with uh, a little bit, I'll say one or two drinks a week of alcohol, while others, that would be, that'd be enough to inhibit or cut their weight loss in half and really slow things down because of the impact on the liver. Because we, we can't, we can't really, you know, you know, this is the coach, you can't look at them and know, oh, it's got to be your liver. It's got to be there's just a certain something going on with your liver. It has, it's too much abuse over the years. It hasn't really, you know, still got some fat, some, some insulin resistance there. We're guessing a little bit and there takes a little bit of trial and error, but I would definitely look at things that are sneaking in and then allowing time for consistency over, over a period. Cause I've, I've had many people lose, let's say 40 pounds pretty, pretty quickly. They start new diet, uh, get them moving. Nothing. It's not perfect. It's not a perfect plan, but it's a plan that's, better than what they had before right and they get to a point where that worked they drop 40 30 40 pounds and then it kind of sticks and it might be time to level up in something it might be time to make a little shift to make some changes just to because the body is like okay we're, we're used to this now uh, or it could again something that's sneaking in that's just keeping them from progressing forward but i think time under you know area under the curve you know time uh, of consistency Many times it's just their body kind of getting a reset and or getting past that set point. And then we make a couple of shifts and then it starts moving again. But it's it, it's so individual. It's really hard to say. But that's that's what I would look at. I'd look at blood work. What are we missing? Closely look at diet. What are we missing? Can we level up somewhere else? Can we no, level think, up in the exercise? You know? I think that's great. Um, it, you brought up alcohol a few times. I'm curious because we don't we assume and this is probably naive on our end, but we assume that most people aren't drinking. And we do have a question in our questionnaire of uh, how many drinks do you have in a, in a week? And most people say zero. And it might just be because we work again with the chronic illness community. Right. We do sometimes see triglycerides go up and the only thing they're adding is alcohol. And so that's where I can see the imbalances. But just your take, it sounds like you have seen if people are dialing in their diet, um, let's say they're dialing in their sleep and they have some level of movement. Are you saying that alcohol can impact or inhibit weight loss? Just alcohol? Absolutely. They can do everything right. I've had people, you know, intermittent fasting, eating clean, working out hard, you know, strength training three times a week, doing cardio on the, on the other days, doing what I thought was everything right, but coming home and having 
a drink or two, three, four nights a week, just to just take the edge off of work. And uh, he may be losing quarter pound a week doing everything right. It's like, why is this sticking? Reduce the alcohol to either zero or maybe one night a week. You have one or two drinks one night a week. And it goes back to pound and a half, two pounds a week. Wow. So it's just, it can really stand in the way because of the impact on the liver. It's, it's hormonal. It's not caloric, right? Alcohol's threat is not really caloric. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's hormonal impact on, and the toxic, the, the impact it has on the liver's ability to process, uh, well, fat, but I mean, really it's impact on, on, I mean, we know alcohol creates fat in the liver, which yeah. clogs those, uh, cells with fat and then in, which impacts the uh, ability for the liver to control our blood sugar but the liver is controlling our blood sugar mm -hmm. and has to respond to insulin and glucagon right properly so if we start impairing its ability to do that because it's tied up trying to detox alcohol or because it's become started to become a little fatty from that alcohol that's our blood sugar that's that's our insulin sensitivity that's the, that's where it all starts is at the liver and so uh, we we really underestimate. I think for a long time, people talk about the you know the, oh it only has this many calories. Oh, I'll have red wine, and it's like that's great. Yeah, beer will put weight on anybody, or a sugary cocktail will put weight on anybody because you're adding sugar or adding grain to that alcohol. But the alcohol still has an, a hormonal impact that people don't seem to um, give enough weight to when it comes to uh, stabilizing their blood sugar. And, and you and I know it's it, that's what it comes down to. We're trying to stabilize blood sugar to allow for fat burning. That's funny because, so I haven't drank since uh, many, a long time ago, ever since having kids, I nursed and then I had a pregnancy right after. So I basically have not drank in a long time. And then I got into wellness. So it's really hard to even fathom drinking again. So for me, it's always like, oh, it's a non, it's like not an issue. I won't drink, but I never thought about, there's always those keto drinks, the alcoholic, like, oh, this doesn't have sugar. It's low carb or drink a vodka because there's zero grams of carbohydrates. But I never thought about the, I never thought of it in the, well, without carbs, it still can impact your liver, which obviously this is such a fundamental, uh, like a, a basic thing, but yeah, mm -hmm. it, it will absolutely impact healing. So then is your general recommendation, no alcohol, if people are really trying to refine their, their body composition? Yeah. I mean, if they're, if okay. they're trying to refine their body competition, I tell them the best thing you do is not to drink. Okay. And if you at most two drinks a week at most and keep those as low calorie, I mean like a red wine or a straight alcohol or something like that as possible, if they're going to do it, but ideally not at all while they're doing it. And then once they're in maintenance mode, then we can maybe find a sweet spot that allows them to maintain and um, and, and they'll know what to do if they start putting weight on, they know they got to cut back, but maybe they find, you know, then it, but once they've done that, once they've cut it out, usually that scales back their perception of how much they really need and their sensitivity to alcohol. The thing with alcohol, it's very easy to start off with one or two drinks a week and it snowballs into totally. two drinks a night, three or four times a week, because you, one, you desensitize to it. And two, it just, it's just one of those things that's, it's, it's, it's very easy to, to, to for it to multiply right into uh two or three times you know what it what it was when you when you uh started or a minimal level so eliminating it is best and if there's a special occasion where you want to have one or two drinks like a birthday or an anniversary i get it but when you're on the path to really changing your metabolic health or reversing some sort of autoimmune or something like that it's alcohol is not your friend agreed it, it's your enemy it is truly your enemy. It's because you're, you, you're, it's, it's, it's a hormonal impact. You just can't, you can't be, it can't be undone. You've got to wait for it to be. And then if it's cumulative over several nights a week, you're spending most of your time in a, in a not mentally impaired or cognitively impaired, but a hormonally impaired position to really stabilize uh, blood sugar and appropriately uh, metabolize energy. Yeah. I think the other things that are bad of alcohol is obviously the addictive side. So it's, why do you need that drink? If we know that it's not ideal for us, why do we need it? And when we use it to, like you said, take the edge off work, or we're just trying to escape or veg out those reasons there, there can be a healthier swap. And if you can't do that, then there might be an addiction or some thing that you're trying to escape from to turn to that alcohol. So I think for that addictive side, it's probably not ideal. I, um, I used to think that addiction just meant you drink a lot and therefore then you're an addict, but actually it's do the inability to do without is the addiction. It's if you cannot say no, 
that is an, the addiction of right. uh, in, in the alcohol, um, at least specifically for alcohol. And then the other thing is, I know a lot of women will, and uh, maybe it's because we work a lot with women, but women will use it to decompress and then be able to go to bed, um, especially with wine. Oh, yeah. And the, yeah. the thing is, it affects your sleep in a horrible way. So you, it may knock you out, but you will not get that deep restorative sleep that supports your immune system, that organizes all, um, all the things that happened in the day and, and then reduces the toxin load and like cleans up everything. That stuff does not happen as you drink alcohol. So then in the morning you're tired. So then you get on coffee and it's this vicious cycle of hormones, which, um, I'll ask you about, but it's, so I think for everything you brought up, absolutely. We should not drink alcohol, but then there's other things too. And then the breakdown products are truly toxic. That breaks down to aldehyde, which is toxic for us. So for all of these reasons, it's interesting though, in the carnivore space, for some reason, alcohol gets a pass. Um, I don't know if you've noticed that in the space, but it's like, I can have my, um, my vodka or my, all, any of the hard liquors. It's fine. As long as it's, you know, doesn't have sugar. And it's like, really? And the, I don't know, but so it's, yeah, I, I found one, maybe it was just age, but as I was really the, I mean, when I was really got hardcore in the low carb and, and intermittent fasting, when I drank, I didn't feel good. Like it was when it, when it had a, a more, you know, a balanced diet, it was, and now of course, again, I was a lot younger, but uh i just i noticed you know it was it was different but processing that alcohol without a significant amount of carbohydrate in my diet when that's been eliminated or okay. greatly reduced uh it just it hit different like the back end of it i felt i didn't feel good and, or it just made me or it just got well, sleepy like you said it puts you to sleep initially but the impact from it was not ideal so i don't know why these people who are carnivores are feeling like that that feels good to them. I mean, maybe they have a different reaction than I do. I could see if they're having one here and there, but I, I can't imagine having two or three drinks several nights a week eating that way. It just, it just, right. it, my body didn't process it well, but I, and I, I couldn't explain that, but, but yes, I, I think it's odd that we give it a pass because we're doing something else that's benefiting our fat burning in a way or, or meta- metabolism in a certain way uh it it, it does not deserve a pass <laughs> agreed agreed so what about hormones oftentimes okay. when we run blood work we test a lot of the thyroid hormones as well as the sex hormones but maybe we we let's maybe we can assume that the thyroid hormones are balanced and if it's not there's you know you can get on the thyroid medications but assuming that you're having a sufficient protein fat and then iodine cleaning up your diet sleep all of those will support the thyroid but focusing on the sex hormones, we do see okay. a drop in all of the markers, estrogen, progesterone, DHEA, testosterone as we age, but lifestyle factors can all obviously affect that. In our space, there's such a division of, as you get older, why not age more gracefully and get on bioidenticals? And then there's a whole other subset that say, well, that's not natural. Even if it looks identical, it's still made from plants or um, it's there's just these risks with taking it and Um, And then people on both sides say it does cause cancer. And the other side says it doesn't cause cancer. That was more of the non-bioidentical. So where's your stance on all of that? I haven't, to be really candid, I haven't done enough research yet um, Mm. to have a stance other than I like to be more natural. But ever since being in the carnivore space and working with chronic illness people a long time, I know that it's not always possible to be fully natural. Like that's the, you know, the, the real, real talk of being in wellness. So what, what's your take and um, what have you seen? Well, my experience has been that as we age, whether they're, whether they're optimized at optimal health level, optimal health or not, you're going to see a reduction in those sex hormones, right? It's kind of, it's inevitable. And, and we've seen uh, even, you know, very healthy uh, carnivores and, and people in the animal based space post sometimes their, their blood work. And it's like, they have low testosterone. They may not choose to add the, the bioidentical hormones, but they have very like low testosterone or levels are not ideal. They're not optimal. And so each person has to decide whether they want to, you know, if they want to be natural, fine, they're going to, they're going to have to muscle through that. Or if they want to optimize and take their hormone levels back to where they were, maybe in their thirties or, or, or 40, uh, that's definitely a personal decision. Mm-hmm. The majority of my clients in that age group are on some form of bioidentical hormone replacement therapy including myself and my wife. So, uh, and we found 
that most of them, once they, once they begin that, they feel much better. There's, it's not about, there's, I think there's a misconception that it has, that's about adding, especially with, especially with testosterone, adding muscle, or it's about putting on more muscle or about, it's like, that's like number 10 at the bottom of the list. As far as I'm okay. concerned, there is the, just a total outlook on life, a, a removal of some, some of the brain fog or, uh, the tiredness that can kind of hit in the afternoon just from fatigue. There's just a better mood, improvement in mood, better sleep. Um, it's, uh, I have one client who's a singer. Uh, she was a Broadway singer when she was younger and now she produces some off Broadway stuff and she's 54. Now she's saying she's hitting notes. She's got her on testosterone as well as the other, uh, you know, estrogen progesterone to support her on the other side of, of menopause. And, the testosterone not only improved her outlook on life, but she's hitting notes that she hasn't hit since her thirties and she's 54. So she's hitting high C's because her, her vocal cords are recovering and getting lubricated like they did back in her thirties. And so it's just generally a one, a better outlook on life, uh, improved insulin sensitivity. Uh, and, and they're showing, I see more and more studies coming out showing, uh, the, uh, reduced risk of Alzheimer's and dementia over time with, with women and men who are on some form of bioidentical hormone replacement therapy. What, what basically what you're doing is you're cheating age. And so the bioidentical is important. One of those, some of those studies that came out in the nineties with like with the women's health initiative, uh, those that, sh that showed some sort of risk with, uh, estrogen, adding estrogen or adding progesterone, they were using synthetic right. estrogen and progesterone, which is basically what we find that synthetic progesterone is what we find in, in, birth control, right? Birth control pills. But uh, there was no, there was no, there's, there has not been found any cancer risk with bioidentical progesterone and estrogen. And if you, we think about this, if we're elevating hormones to a level that we were in our, maybe they were in their twenties or thirties. Okay. Do we have a lot of 20 and 30 year olds coming out with, you know, at, at cancer risk mm -hmm. or right. Or in general, uh, because of hormones levels, because of their natural hormone levels? No. So what we're doing is that we're actually, we still have to deal with old parts, right? We still have old bones, we still have tissue. But what we're doing is helping a certain part. It's a, it is a hack. It's not natural. And if you want to live like a caveman, if you want to live primal, then no, that's, it's, that's, then it doesn't fit your ideology or your whatever, your, you know, how you want to approach your life. That's fine. But there is quite an edge given to people who are trying to optimize their health and optimize hormones that uh, there's found across the board with delaying disease or preventing disease uh, with having those hormones at, at, at higher levels than they would be if you're just, you know, uh, letting them diminish naturally. And, and diet isn't going to fix that. I mean, you can, if you, if someone is metabolically unhealthy, you can, if they're younger, you can make a big swing, I think with diet and exercise and improve that because they have more potential for it to be higher. They've just lowered it because of their lifestyle. But once you get past say 47, 50 years old, uh, their age is, is a factor. And so you can certainly improve all of those markers with, imp and, and I, as I said, that, that has to be the foundation, but there's only so much you can do. You might improve at 10 or 20%, but 10 or 20% of a minimal level when you're like, for instance, a guy's free testosterone is down in the single digits mm -hmm. and it say it's at six and it goes, you, know, you prove it 20%, it goes to seven and a half or eight. That's not a big improvement. He's not going to feel that you you got to get, you, you're looking at having, to, you know, wanting to double or triple his numbers, his free testosterone with a bioidentical replacement. Women, I, I mean, when menopause hits those, estrogen and progesterone fall off a cliff, I know. right? I mean, it literally drops, they feel it. And for many, some women, it, it's very individualized. They can say, oh, you know what, I'm okay. They can cruise through it. They're, they're fine with it. And they want to power through it. That's fine. But many women, they get depressed. They, their outlook on life is greatly diminished. They, they, they just lose any kind of drive uh, and vitality. And so to give that back to somebody, with something as simple as like, let's just elevate your hormones. The, the risk to benefit ratio seems to uh, make them feel like, I think I get more benefit than risk by, by replacing these hormones. That was my long winded answer, but I mean. No, I love it. I love it.
it's four to five years, four or five years of experience with this, with my clients, with my myself and my wife and, and finding m- much more upside than, than risk when it's properly managed. Let me, let me ask a couple questions behind this. Um, sure. Do you mind if I ask you what your age is? Cause you look very healthy. <laughs> I'm 53. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So, and what, what do you supplement? Testosterone. Okay. So, and do you feel a whole lot better or was there? Yes. Yeah, so I didn't realize it. What's funny with, with men, their testosterone, unlike women where the progesterone and estrogen just kind of falls off a cliff with men, it's a much more slow decline. Sure. And so we might, we just like, we're just get used to the misery, right? We get used to, it's like you develop a new normal and you think the brain fog in the afternoon is normal and the, and the kind of the, the sluggishness or the lack of creativity or the, the you lose a little bit of your, your drive. Mm-hmm. And so when I began supplementing, it was like, oh my gosh, the lights came on upstairs. It was like, it was much more of that drive to, I'm going to write a book, you know, or I want to, I want to, I want to do, I want to go after this. You kind of get, it, it helped me get out of a rut per, on a personal level. Um, yes, I put on more muscle than I've been able to keep at that point, but we're talking about something. It's not like a steroid where you, it, 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 you might put on 10 or 12 pounds, give or t- on average of added muscle and some fluid, but it's not a, it's it, to think of it, to, to pair it up like you would with a synthetic steroid. It's just not, doesn't make sense. It, and it's not something a bodybuilder would use to put on 30, 40 pounds of muscle. It's just, it's, they're not in the same family. And so this is a much more about mental uh, c- creativity and drive and uh, more emotional, even some emotional stability, um, better sleep, better recovery. And it, you just, it's just, you, you feel like you, um, you can kind of pair your, the wisdom that you've gained over the many decades of your life and your career with the energy you might've had in your thirties and you can better leverage that. And that's how I try to explain to people, you, you're going to, you're going to have the energy that you had when you're younger, but you're going to be able to hang on to all the wisdom and ideas and the way you, everything you've learned over the last 30, you know, years of your career. And so it's a great, it's a great pairing for someone who's really trying to keep going forward in their fifties and sixties. And, and, and before you got on T yeah. you improved your diet and all like all the life. Oh, I was, diet. yeah, I was, okay. Oh, I've been dialed in for, okay. yeah. I mean, decades. Okay. Yeah. I was, I was a lean, I mean, you know, ballpark right around 10% body fat okay. working out three or four times a week with strength training. I was a trainer. I mean, I, and yeah, so I wasn't, I was a never deconditioned or metabolically unhealthy. So here, yeah. here's the, the, the other side I hear, which I mean, okay. obviously I understand it, but the thought is that if you understand the sex hormonal pathway, it starts with acetyl-CoA uh, cholesterol, and then it breaks down into all the different variant hormones. When you have too much cortisol in your body or needs of cortisol, everything will then all the different hormones, instead of going to DHEA, progesterone, it'll have that steel from the progesterone. Um, and maybe I'll put that up right here, but a progesterone steel, and it goes, then everything gets shuttled to make cortisol. So in the sort of like the natural wellness, you could call it the caveman wellness, but, um, their thought is if you improve your lifestyle factors, improve that cortisol, then everything else can go where they're supposed to. Now I know with age, the hormones can drop, but I think people believe that as long as we improve our blood sugar, which will then require less cortisol output, we balance our insulin and then we get proper sleep and we fix our environment and all those things, then our cortisol will be improved enough. And then all the downstream sex hormones will properly function. And I think the thought is that you have to do everything to improve what I just shared before you get on these exogenous hormones. And there are people in our carnivore space that believe that. So therefore you should never get on these exogenous hormones because it's not natural. Have you seen people dial in everything and just the age factor alone makes it that they may need the additional bioidentical supports? My fasting insulin was three. Okay. I started. Okay. (laughs) I was, like I said, somewhere between nine, 10, 11% body fat very fit. You can look up my Instagram, see pictures of me back then. Uh, I looked very young. I was not, you know, I was like 47. (laughs) Well, I was 47 then. So I mean, 47, 48. And, uh, I, I mean, it was, I was fit. My, my doc was excited because he said, 
he usually has sick people coming to him, right? People are metabolically unhealthy, and he's giving this as a as a as a kind of a helpful leverage, helping them leverage their habits, right? So you're going to feel more like working out if you do this. We're going to have more insulin sensitivity with the testosterone, as example. Uh, and with women, it's just, you know, outlook on life. They feel like working out. They feel they have, they're not leaning on alcohol or comfort foods as much because they feel better. So, I mean, well, there's one comes before the other. I get it. I hate to see one, you know, someone use it as a crutch, not to change their lifestyle. I think it's can be beneficial as a tool to help them feel like changing, making changes because they just in general feel better and they don't have to medicate as much. But, you know, I mean, each person has to make that choice and I would never tell someone they were right or wrong, but it's what you're willing to endure because there, again, age is only, I mean, your lifestyle habits are only going to impact so much as we age. Age is inevitable. Age is the number one risk factor for death, right? It really is. And so age has an impact and we can measure these hormones. We can measure them in, in to the point, say, this is an age, this is a range. Now, how do you feel? And, and, and from there, go with how do you feel in this range? And then make improvements around those ranges. But we generally know what is optimal and what is suboptimal. And so if you're feeling the symptoms, there's classic symptoms of, of low sex hormones that would be different, a little different from men and women, but pretty much put you in the same place you could correct that how you feel and some of those side effects with th these hormones. I'm not sure if I answered your question, but it's just, I, I don't, I work with people and I personally want to live optimally. Yeah. And so if there's a tool that helps me live optimally, right? I, everything has a risk to benefit ratio. Every diet has a risk to benefit ratio, yes. right? Strength training has a risk to benefit ratio. Driving has a risk to benefit ratio. How natural do you want to go? Shoes are shoes natural. I mean, I I perform better wearing shoes when I'm trying to get from here to there than I do barefoot. I'll get barefoot on the ground for granted, but I mean, when I'm trying to get around, I put on shoes and I don't walk everywhere. I get in a car, so I look at these as a tool that helps me perform better. And there's plenty of research to show that they prevent more disease than they cause, especially when properly managed. And so, to me, the risk to benefit ratio says the bioidentical hormones are going to extend life and extend health span uh, much more so than, than not having them. And so uh, that's, I mean, that's, that's my personal experience. I think what you bring up that um, I never considered in this whole equation is, so if somebody's like, no, I'm going to fight through and muscle through this perimenopause or, or getting into menopause and I'm gonna fight through it and not be on these hormones, but then they turn to food and they binge or they turn to alcohol. We never put those as risk factors of not having ideal health either. So mm -hmm. I, I do think in an ideal world, so this is how maybe I, I view it after talking with you, but it, you know, clean up your diet, do the exercise, focus on your sleep, make sure your environment's clean, uh, get the junky carbs out of your diet as much as possible, get that insulin as sensitive as possible, mm -hmm. and then see where your hormones fall. If you feel you've given everything an honest, earnest try, and your hormones don't look ideal, it's something to dabble. And if you feel you have no motivation in life, or you feel every morning you wake up and you have brain fog, or you are tired, maybe mm -hmm. it is some lever to consider and then, and then trying it and then doing your own research, figuring out because I'm not at that age yet. So I just don't right. like, I, it is a non-concern for me right now. Right. But I will right. get there. And so you bring up strong arguments. If I end up having low energy and I just keep using caffeine to pull the cortisol lever is, or I could have just used a little bit of progesterone or so it's a, right. it's a valid argument. Um, and then, and, and it's just, I, I'm not there yet, so I cannot empathize. And that's just being me being right. wholly honest. Um, but, and it's just easy to go, well, we should all be natural, but I think your arguments, yeah, it, it's true. We, we pick and choose when we want to use that narrative too, right. Of like, let's go more natural or not. We do, we do. And until you experience that, it's hard to empathize. You don't really understand. It's not, we're not yeah. just older. We're not just, you know, we don't, we don't just have to be more disciplined. There's, there is a definite impact to how well your organs function. They have a, they have like a lifespan for reproduction because right. we're talking about reproductive hormones and our bodies have a, have a lifespan or a certain span that for which we are wired for reproduction. And after that point, the, the body is wired to say, well, we really no longer need those organs are need producing 
uh, hormones at this level because we're past the point of reproducing. And so unless you, I mean, let's, if we're being honest about it, okay, so your hormones are going down, you think you power through it. Are you going to be capable of reproducing when you're 55 or 60 or 65 years old? Probably not. Hormonally, some men can, but they may not feel too well. Women definitely, I mean, the hormones go, the, the, the ovaries are done. So you're not, if they're not at a reproductive level, then you're missing something. There's something missing. Now, whether you choose to modify that with uh, exogenous hormones or not, that's that's up, obviously up to you. Look at the other symptoms. But we clearly are not in a position to continue to perform or reproduce, especially women, uh, on the same level sure. that we were you know, in, in your 30s. And so that has to have a downstream impact on other areas as well. We can't ignore that. We can't say... Well, that's just for having a baby and that's isolated. Right. There, our bodies don't work that way. There's going to be an impact. And those hormones are also used for other things than just exactly. being babies. But I, I mean, and, and the other. That's, what I'm, that's my point. Yeah. That's yeah. my point. There's that. I mean, it's, we can't produce babies. So what else are we not capable of? Right. What, what is the other negative impact that's being felt by having those hormones at such a low level? They will be reduced. There's no, there's no question about that. We've seen, again, we've seen people posting their numbers who are very healthy, strong people. And I personally would, if I were that person, I'd be supplementing hormones. <laughs> Certain vitamin D forms are also hormonal and people yeah. supplement vitamin D all the time. So I just think it's the, it's that whole yeah. picking and choosing the, the decision. Yeah. Um, so I just, I, I do find it interesting especially for males, prostate cancer, prostate issues, enlargement mm -hmm. of prostate happens a lot. What are your thoughts about testing? Like, do you recommend certain testing? I know you recommend blood work and I think everyone should get an, at least an annual blood work just to see where they are. But oh, yeah. uh, what about prostate testing? Do you, do you recommend any lifestyle things or is there anything that you recommend separately for, for that illness? Well, I mean, you definitely want a PSA on every blood work, especially if someone's going to be adding testosterone. They want they always add PSA if they're looking at testosterone. They're looking at PSAs to make sure they aren't out of range or elevated because that's something you would have to modify or, or just if they were out of range. But you always want to keep an eye on that. I think I don't know if I can speak specifically to prostate cancer. I don't know if we know enough about it to say this causes prostate right, cancer, right, but. Right. I, I will say this, we know there's no 20 year olds getting prostate cancer and they have very high testosterone levels. Okay. So I don't, so to say that having high testosterone leads to prostate cancer or causes prostate cancer or, or, or oh, I don't think I've prostate, ever heard that. Yeah. No, no, but you'll hear people <laughs> say that yeah. you'll hear people say, Oh no, oh. Take testosterone will enlarge your prostate. No, if you have an enlarged prostate or have prostate cancer, then you don't need to add testosterone to it will, it will accelerate the progression but it will not cause it. But there's people who misunderstand the literature and, and think, okay, this having ex, you know exogenous testosterone will increase your risk of prostate cancer. No, because we have 18 and 20 year olds with through the roof testosterone okay. Okay. that don't get prostate. But I think in general, we can look at disease in the, in the aspect of, of stress, right? Or of inflammation, right? And so what we would do to reduce inflammation in any other area of our body is basically going to be what we'd want to do to avoid prostate cancer. I think there's there's some inevitability of an enlarged prostate with men. It's like, when will it happen? Mm -hmm. Not if. So is it going to happen in your 60s or is it going to happen in your 90s, right? Or is it going to happen when you're 110? Some of that is genetic, but I think these days, a lot of it is lifestyle. And when we have, when we're taking in these highly processed foods, which cause metabolic stress and inflammation, uh, basically oxidative stress is the, is, the, is the best term for it, oxidative stress. Oxidative stress affects every organ in our body. We are not isolated, right? And so I think when we're, especially specific cancers are definitely metabolically driven by insulin and so forth and, and uh, a metabolic disease. But I think in general, from heart disease, dementia, any kind of cancer, including prostate, there's got to be oxidative stress there to cause mutation and inflammation or the dysfunction to begin with. And so I, I can't point to something that says oxidative stress from your crappy diet is going to cause prostate cancer. But I would say you're, you're at a much better risk level if you can remove these foods and reduce your oxidative stress as you age to, um, to avoid 
any cancer or delay, at the very least delay any cancer. Yeah. I had a client that were started working with us and had an enlarged prostate as they cleaned up their diet. Um, I think they noticed that dairy felt at least not that they tested um, during that part of the elimination diet, but dairy felt like there was a, um, a factor in inflaming, but I think it's really mm. the inflammatory part of it, not the cheese it's, or the dairy itself. But mm -hmm. for some people, maybe it might be, it, it could be a food that maybe causes sensitivity that then causes inflammatory responses in the body that then affect their prostate. But um, I, I agree with you. I think it's, it's driven by inflammation. So it's, so that person eventually found out they were living in mold illness and that reduction of mold and inflammation from mold and uh, mycotoxins was what allowed their, um, it didn't totally shrink the size, but it reduced the pain at least from it. And so mm -hmm. I, I would have to agree to you, uh, agree with you that a lot of it is just stemming. The goal is always to reduce inflammation in the body and a big portion is from food, but then there's other things that can also cause the inflammation to, to rise too. Right. Oh yeah. I'll, there could be environmental uh, yeah. factors for sure. Yeah. And then uh, what about exercise? So you brought up the importance of exercise. What would you generally recommend? Is there like an exercise regimen before your forties and then afterward that you would recommend, or is it all sort of the same? Well, I think that we can tolerate more when we're younger or uh, <laughs> under 40. I think, you know, like extended cardio, like lots of run, someone's doing lots of running and it's working for them, or if they're lifting weights five or six days a week and they're not showing signs of of, of, of that catching up with them, then okay. I mean, I, I still don't recommend it, but they're getting away with it. I think over 40, we have to be more, we have to pay more attention to our recovery and how it's impacting our sleep and that stress and that compounded stress. I don't, I, I see more and more with people who are athletic, I mean, high level athletes, even in college and in their twenties and thirties, once they get in their forties, they've got to reduce, you know, do fewer Ironman, do, don't do so many marathons, look for shorter distance. If you're going to have to, if you're going to run or reduce the running or find another sport, uh, reduce the impact on the joints, uh, with strength training, I, I, you know, reducing the volume, you know, not having more rest days. And I think two, two to four strength training days a week done wisely, like with, with a good plan is, is beneficial for anyone 40 and up uh, 40 to however old you can get and keep showing up to the gym beyond that. Uh, you're, you're, I think you're pushing the needle in my, in my experience. And so I think it's more about managing the recovery and the stress, because that is all inflammation, as we've talked about before with the inflammation, it's, it can cause, it, if it's inflammation, we cannot recover from, then it's, it's a negative. There, then we, we, we're increasing the risk and we're, that, that could start outweighing the benefit again, the risk to benefit ratio. And so we have to pay attention to, to the individual strength training, I think is very important for retaining muscle and bone mass, which we know starts to diminish as we age part of that's hormonal, but a lot of it is Maybe we're more sedentary, but we also just start, we start losing it. It's just part of the aging process. And so we really have to fight to keep uh, that lean mass and strong bones. We know the number one risk factor for, for, for injuries for people 65 and older is falling. Right. Now we can all fall, right? We can fall playing soccer or ride a bike or whatever we do. Kids fall all the time. Nobody ends up breaking a hip and getting pneumonia, right? And being bedridden until you're, over 60 and where that's a very common occurrence. And so you need, it, you need to be able to be durable, right. And resilient. And that, I think that begins with making sure we're hanging on to lean mass and keeping our bones strong and then adding in some cardiovascular exercise two, three times a week as well to, to make sure that we're uh, creating nitric oxide and our blood pressure is, is, is being able to, you know, be managed uh, naturally and, that our, our heart's in good condition. We just, it just, we have to be a little more deliberate, I think in the way we execute it. So we're not adding too much risk and then we're not adding too much volume risk from the execution. So whether it's impact or how heavy the weight is or paying attention to injuries or how the joints are feeling. And the other side of that is allowing for enough recovery that we're not overtraining. And then keeping protein at the center of that uh, high enough to, for recovery, I think that we also need to, you know, to add to that, uh, maybe make sure we're very deliberate about getting adequate protein and maybe a little more than we took in, in our thirties and forties, as we get close to fifties and sixties, just making sure be, because it becomes a little harder to assimilate, we might yeah. have to catch it up totally. a little bit.
Yeah. So two to four times of strength training. And yeah. is there a specific amount? I know that's again, individualized, but is there like a minimum amount that people should at least do? Is it just body weight is sufficient or should we be lifting beyond body weight? Um, I guess if you're trying to grow, you would need more than that. But, and then, oh, yeah. and then the cardio, um, I agree. I think even just getting your heart muscle to like work a little bit more. I know that in the low carb space, they don't really care for cardio, but I think it's important for these other factors than just the lean body mass. Um, and right. so that's a few times a week. Can you do both on the same day or is, do you recommend them separately? What are your thoughts with that? I mean, you can do that. It's better to do them when you can do them. You know, okay. so if you have three days a week where, you know, Hey, look, I can devote an hour. <laughs> I do half an hour, one half hour, the other 40 minutes of one, 20 minutes, the other. And that's what you have. It's about the consistency over time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. more so than what your week looks like. You know, I mean, I definitely think you need to schedule it and be very deliberate about getting it done. Uh, I definitely tell people to try to work close to when it comes to their strength training, that needs to be challenging. It needs to be where, where they're working close to the point of failure, where that, that exercise you would fatigue or write up, write up maybe one or two reps before they would completely fatigue and, and find a way to safely do that. If a, putting a bar on your back to squat may not be the safest way to do that. I, I wouldn't, I don't like going that close to it. I, I do it, but not often, you know, I, I, I'm careful with it, but I've been strength training since I was 17 years old. I've been strength training for 36 years. So when it was coming to, into it, hit the machines, find machines, find something where you feel safe or bands or, a you know, find a way to use your, if you're using body weight, get the body, you know, put yourself at an angle with a TRX strap or using, put your feet on a bench, doing what you need to do to get close to that area of fatigue, whatever apparatus you're using, but do it safely. So you can push up close to that point of failure and not be in the danger of, of injury or something like that, or not be able to get yourself out of that position. So work safely, but definitely work intensely, but not as many, you know, sets as you would have done when you were 20. And so I think the consistency over time, frequency. So even if it's a short workout, 20, 30 minutes of intense movement, you know, or, or working to that point of intensity with strength training for 30 minutes, 20, 30, 40 minutes, two or three times a week can make a big impact over the course of years if you're consistent, right? And that's what we need. We, we, get, we have to think long-term. We have to think about consistency. It's not a two-month push before bikini season right it's it's or before a, or your daughter's wedding or something like that this is what you do forever right you've got to keep moving or your body will start to you know lose muscle mass it will start to slow down and when your body stops when the body when you know it, 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 you that's when that's when things start to go when people retire to the to the the easy chair and the, and the clicker there, that, that, that's the beginning of the end that, you know, things start to unravel. And so constant movement, I mean, you can combine that cardio on those days with your strength training for the more intense activity and then find activities you enjoy that get you outside every day. There's something to the walking on a regular basis that as humans, we were meant to do, we were meant to move. And when we stop moving, we start having problems. So I don't consider walking something that's going to move the needle necessarily on your weight loss or your fitness right. um, level in a, in, a, in a significant way. Walking is, is not a replacement for strength training or cardio. Walking is a replacement for shitting. You know, <laughs> walking is a replacement for sitting still or, or, or having hours and hours and hours of being sedentary. And, so, and it makes your, it stimulates your nervous system, perfusion to the brain, you know, movement, hormones, all of those things are impacted just from you, you, a, a subtle, you know, very low intensity, but con constant movement on a regular basis. And so it sounds like a lot. Yeah. As we get older, if we want to hang on to our health. We have to be more deliberate. We have to be more consistent and disciplined. And there's, there's, we cannot cut ourselves short. We can't shortcut the diet, the exercise, the sleep. If I can't go to the gym and lift and, you know, use, so I'll use mm -hmm. an elliptical to, and go mm -hmm. fast to um, get my heart rate up. Um, mm -hmm. Once in a while I'll run, but if I can't do that, then walking is the thing I do just so that I can mm -hmm. move because as I'm sitting here and working, my limbs are not moving at all. And like you said, the nervous system. And so all of, for those reasons, I will still walk, but absolutely. I don't feel as good as when I go to the gym and I do all of the right. things I just mentioned. And um, I interviewed with Don, Dr. Donald Lehman a while ago, and he brought up that 
more than just the diet. Yes, get the sufficient protein. It's very important. You probably need even the ironic thing is you probably need more protein as you grow because or yeah. age because uh, you don't assimilate like you mentioned. But he said that the risk of falling and then dying from that is so high. It's like right yes. next to cardiovascular if you take off all the different nuances of it. And I was shocked by that. And he said it's because um, especially women, a third of the women that fall will never walk. And then a third will never get out of the hospital and they'll pass away because they don't have enough cushion or muscle mass to protect their bones. And if they, and he said the number one thing that would benefit that is the the maintaining the muscle mass. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. hundred percent. I mean, when you, you get a, a older person bedridden, it yeah. may not be the fall that gets them, but they become more susceptible to mm-hmm. something like pneumonia or some other infection. And, and then that's what takes them out. Right. But it's the, it's the immobility that, that, that lingers after the fall because you were not conditioned to withstand the fall. The immobility is what gets you. It's not the broken hip or this specifically, or it's, it's the immobility. Immobility, again, becomes the weapon against you. That's why in hospitals, they, in, so you don't get body sores, they move you. Yeah, all, the bed sores, off. yeah. yeah and, and, I mean, uh, UTIs, all of those things, and that can lead to sepsis. I mean, there's a host of things that you just don't consider because it's not a risk for you when you're younger. Right. But once you get past 60, 65, it's like suddenly the risks start <laughs> popping up like you've never seen. It's like, oh, okay, I've got to, I've got to keep moving. And, and I've got to be, I can't eat this because this is going to have a, impact me for three days you miss i mean a bad night's sleep when you're 30 you can kind of power through it and get a bad night's sleep when you're 50 or 60 you feel that for three or four days i mean it takes that long to recover it's just it's just how it is and so i I mean as healthy as you can be there's just an impact to age that we can't underestimate and think that oh that's not going to happen to me no it's going to happen to you but if you but how you manage it is crucial and what like the lifestyle habits that, that you you've already established are going to carry you forward. I know from personal experience, they're going to carry you forward where you're going to watch your your other people who are your age who do not have those same habits. They're going to start falling apart, right? Their medication list goes up, their right. waist size gets bigger, they became less mobile, they're more tired, and and you're walking through like a rock star because you've had these habits in place for years and you're just you're doing what you've always done and so it's less of a bump in the road you can manage these things where so but these guys are getting hit like they're getting by a truck yeah what's so interesting is i was talking to one of my mom's friends a while ago and she mentioned that uh for a long time especially when you're younger you eat bad and you don't exercise you don't move you you make a lot of lifestyle choices that are not ideal for health and it doesn't show up for some people but all of a sudden 20 years later you see the you see the difference in the faces of oh wow you've aged like life has been hard for you and Mm -hmm. i think it's I, i i totally understand what you're saying well what about supplements because there's a lot of people that will lift and will take creatine after do you what are your thoughts on, or people you know they take the protein smoothies right after because they need to bulk up their muscles do you do any of that do you recommend any of these supplements I I I generally recommend whole food protein okay and and as as the rule and if you get in a bind where you just can't get it then find a good protein supplement so I I don't I I try not because of the it, especially the impact on blood sugar and all the micronutrients, the, the, the negative impact on blood sugar, that up and down that uh, blood sugar that protein supplements can have. Uh, they usually end up being hungry within a couple hours after taking them because it's such a, a spike and a drop. Sure, sure. So whole food protein tends, it's longer to obviously break down, digest, so you get a little st- more stable response. And so I, I think that's a good backup or if someone's trying to adjust to increase, use it as a, as a way to get there. Creatine though uh, has, again, much more benefit and almost no risk for mm-hmm. studies for the last 30 years. I mean, neuroprotective yes. uh, helps hang on to muscle mass, helps with strength uh, retention and strength gains, muscle gain. So I'm a big proponent of creatine. Uh, Magnesium is another one that I think most of us aren't getting enough of. It can really help with sleep. And as we get older, I mean, it's important for bone health as well. So, I mean, vitamin, I mean, D3, K2 combo. I mean, because I, I don't get enough D3. I try to get the sun as much as I can, but I tend to be lower. But if you have D3 and K2 together, that K2 is really important, I think, for reversing, uh, helping our body reverse arterial plaque, really start reversing that the, the build of plaque and soft plaque, just, just dissipating it. 
So those, you know, magnesium, D3, K2, and um, creatine are probably my most consistent supplements I would take uh, just for, for general health and performance and, and, and longevity. Really, all yeah, creatine I think also supports the gut. There's a lot more research coming yes. out about creatine. I just saw an article of, um, and I didn't read it though, but the headline said um, the supplement that everyone needs to be taking it's creatine. I have this feeling that creatine is the next big thing in the wellness space, but and and there, there's other benefits than to just build mass. Um, if oh, you yeah. look at if you look at electrolyte uh, blends, a lot of ones that are specific for fasting, they'll actually add in creatine as well. So I don't think it's just for, but yeah, there's multiple benefits. And I think everyone is needs to figure out what makes sense for them. One of the last questions I wanted to ask is, um, and maybe this is all hormonally related to, but you know, there, a lot of people lose sex drive over the years. And I mm -hmm. think it's, I think the importance of connection and community is so important to um, have mm -hmm. longevity and happiness long term. And so the, sure. the sex life is so important, especially if you're married and if you're a couple. But as people age, that's a common pain point we see is I don't have a sex drive. I don't have, um, I don't have the desire to, or it hurts or, you know, all those things. What have you seen and what have you done or supported your clientele to improve in that area? That would be the bioidentical hormones hands down. Okay. I mean, hands down, okay. uh, men and women, testosterone, even sometimes some women before they've hit menopause where they don't need the progesterone estrogen yet start with the testosterone. It not only helps with the, the insulin sensitivity and maybe some of the, 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 the fat loss, but it helps their sex drive come back. And it's like, I, and I've talked to the women about, it. I mean, once, once women get past, you know, 45, 50, 50, they get really honest, you know, they're really honest with me or they get to trust me. And they're like, yeah, it really made a big difference. I'm trying to get my husband on it so he can keep up with me. You know, it's like that, I get that, that kind of feedback. And so my, my wife was actually the first one. She was on testosterone before I was and before she hit menopause. And it was a game changer for her as far as her energy, her mindset, but yes, sex drive. And so uh, that again is, is normal. Again, what, you know, our, our, our body saying, Hey, we don't need to make children anymore. We don't, we don't need to be doing this. So sex drive tied to testosterone in men and women. And so, and testosterone is the primary, I mean, still women have more testosterone in their bodies than estrogen or progesterone at any time of the month when when things are at healthy levels testosterone is still the dominant hormone in women you just got you got two others and and it's definitely less than men's whereas we we've, we've got one and that's all we that's all we think about so uh we got we got testosterone going for men and women it definitely helps the sex drive both both parties right and the couple ideally uh on it is going to really benefit that connection so my personal experience as well as uh, what I feedback I get from clients is it's a, it, the testosterone is the game changer for that and keeping that vital. And it is so important for creating that bond, like you said, you know, and, 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 and just keeping the marriage like fun. Right. What about DHA? So I know for men, I think the DHA doesn't convert as well to testosterone, but for women, I mean, DHA is a precursor for testosterone. Yeah. And uh, we have people in our practice because there's a whole um, environmental protocol that they'll be on and DHA is one of the items that drop. And so that's the recommendation to take that. And sometimes for women, we will see the testosterone then go up by a little bit. Have mm -hmm. you tried DHA before testosterone or is it just, you know, testosterone works well. So why even try DHA? I think it would depend on their age. So if you have someone who's a little bit younger, like say not not premenopausal, try the DHA first. Uh, certainly, if they're in the 30s, 40s, yeah, go go the DHA. Uh, but there's a lot of people who do both. You know, they'll do DHA with the exogenous testosterone and and just for that just to, to well-rounded health hormonal benefit. To testosterone adding testosterone prior to say the late 40s is I think something somewhere where you could walk cautiously like that and make and try other things. Once you get in the late forties, it's pretty much expected that it's going to be low. Okay. And so you want to do all those things and it, you could do all of those things and not see a really a much, a, a significant increase in testosterone, at which point you'd want to go with the exogenous if someone really wanted to optimize that. And then you have to go with how they feel like the, and, and with each client, again, it's a, it's a, it's a case by case. Like, how do you feel? You could, here's the ranges. Here's where you are. This is low compared to where you were when you were 30 or 40. Here's where you can go safely. How do you feel? 
And so if they feel like they want to try more and they want more of, you know, the benefit, then you give them a, you give them a try. You let them test it for two or three months and do a blood test afterwards and see what kind of, you know, where the, what range are they in there and how do they feel? So there's a definitely a trial and error. It's not like, bam, here, you're on this. See you later. It's a, because my wife actually now helps manage some people's hormones. She's an RN. And so it's part of her uh, service. And so we're seeing it's a test, it's a trial run where let's let's add this at this dosage, go for this range, and then we retest in you know 30, 60, or 90 days. Sure. And and how do you feel? And 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 tweak it. And then we you can you generally speaking, the feedback is. I feel so much better. Oh, I lost 10 pounds, 15 pounds. Oh, I'm working out more consistently. I mean, to answer your question, D- I, I think I think you're correct in that DHA seems to have a bigger impact with women than with men, or just it just seems to be more successful mm-hmm. consistently. And I've seen some women who just they do just fine with the DHA, uh, but up to a point, okay. up to a point, or up to an age an age where you might just need to pull the trigger and, and, and do both. So. Yeah, I think ultimately with all of these sex hormones until you're suffering. So my husband suffers from migraines occasionally. It's very rare and as he cleans up his diet, he rarely gets it. Mm-hmm. But when he does, he's like you don't know how it feels because you don't get migraines. And there was this I got my first migraine ever a couple years ago and then I remember thinking, just give me whatever there is to stop right. this pain. And mm-hmm. it's just until, you know, like I I keep using this quote but it's um, from Mike Tyson. You have a, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face. And so until yeah. you experience it, you'll get punched in the face and say, tell me that you're not going to want to have, there's this easy answer of exogenous hormones, assuming that you're trying the diet and lifestyle and doing all the right, right things and it's still not improving. And, and I talked to a friend that recently got on exogenous hormones and I told her, you know, there's possibly risk. Like we just don't know for sure, for sure that there's no risk. And she put it out there and she said, look, like I'm keto carnivore. I, I I do everything. She wears the HRV. She drinks the cleanest water. She does exercise. And she says, I just don't have the energy. And she's even gone through the environmental illness stuff. And for her, there's really nothing else to pursue. And she said, Mm -hmm. if I died, even if worst case is that it kills me earlier, let's just say that obviously there's nothing that says that specifically, but let's just say, I'd rather have a more fulfilled life and enjoyment of today and for however long then prolong my life and feel miserable and so for that alone I'm willing to take that risk and I had nothing to say because how do you argue that right I I thought of the situation when I my husband would get on his sumatriptan for migraine I'm like I don't know what's in that but that's toxic like we got to figure out what's causing the inflammation in your brain and and then when I experienced it myself I was like Oh my gosh, this is the worst. I, I didn't even know that this shiny thing I was feeling in my eyes, like, oh, wow, wow, that is really painful. And for me to say, just sleep, put fish oil or magnesium under your tongue and salt. And, and I just, I felt like, I felt so sad that I was saying that when I now know how painful it is. And so mm-hmm. I think everyone ultimately needs to make the decision based on their own lives. And, yeah. and I, I don't know if I won't consider it when I get to that age, or if I'm not, if my energy is so low and I know that I've looked at everything and it's just that, mm-hmm. okay, well, my blood work shows my progesterone and estrogen are low. And I know that I can pull that lever. Am I not willing to, because I just want to stay natural. Like, I don't know if I can say that and being full candid and, and luckily I'm not there yet, but mm-hmm. it's just something to consider because I think if we want optimal wellness, if you, if you're just trying to get through the day, then maybe you don't need it. But if you want to do more, maybe it's something to consider. I I think the points you shared are so valid and I'd be interested to see what the comments are down below in, um, in our talk. And, and I'm sure Mm. people will share, like I've done it, it changed my life. And I'm sure other people will say you should not do it, but um, it'll be interesting, but, you know, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, where can people find you? Do you work with people one-on-one? Do you do groups if you can share? And I know you have a book, so if you can also plug your book. Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> with a book, as you mentioned before, I wrote with Dr. Ken Berry called kicking ass after 50, we go on a diet. It's really a lot of diet exercise and sleep okay. in there with a big, biggest chapter on diet. And it, it is written toward uh, men primarily, 
Now, there's plenty in there to be gleaned as a, as a woman. The only thing I would say is I'm, I'm not a big fan of, uh, I, I found more and more that intermittent fasting is not something that a lot of women tolerate well with hormonally and cortisol and so forth. Agreed. And so Agreed. that would be the only thing that I think would, would change. But as far as diet and the exercise portion, uh, uh, you know, run with it. Uh, but Kicking Ass After 50, which found on Amazon, my website is zangriggs.com. I'm pretty active on Instagram as Zangriggs Fitness. Okay. Um, and, but if, and I have a, a free, download that's called free 40 plan.com mm -hmm. uh which is will download kind of what i went through in 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 trying to figure things out for myself after you know going 40 and, and into 50 but zangreeks.com will have all of my socials where if you want to find me there and yes i do work with people one-on-one -on -one as a as a coach both remotely and and i do i still have a human person but primarily a, a remote coach where i'm looking at you know we'll look at blood work We'll get not just diet, exercise, and sleep, but we're going to look at blood work, try to get an aura ring or something like that on you, and just start looking at all the aspects of your health and your and match those up with your lifestyle habits so that you can have, you know, really optimize your health. And if there's other things that are needed, you know, like we, we talked about uh, today, then I can connect you with the people who can who can help you with that. So, and, and your uh, your wife can sometimes help with the dosing because she's a nurse. Is that correct? Yeah. So in certain states, she can do remote. Oh, she has okay. a license, a no, compact license to go with certain states. You know what I mean? But, uh, but yeah, she is, then I would refer you to her. She'll, she can run blood work and, and look at those things. I mean, she does manage a few of my clients' hormones and so forth like that. But I mean, many times someone's private, you know, personal, they're already, their con con current uh, practitioner can help them with that as well. And I'm not trying to like, I'm not trying to take that, take that or uh, get in the middle of that relationship. But I can advise them based on my experience with my clients as a non-medical professional. Here's what I have seen, you know, anecdotally and what I would think you'd want to shoot for. I'm, I'm versed enough to know what's off and what would be ideal. Well, but go ahead. No, I was just going to say, well, you've lived the whole life of it, right? So you've been in the wellness fitness space your whole life. And then you're mm -hmm. now as you are you know, going through the age, you're trying to fine tune and figure out what will still give optimal wellness. And you're just right. trying to figure that out. And you, I mean, and, and you did the research writing that book. And then and now you see clients or have been seeing clients. And so you also know what works. I think the one-on-one -on -one is so important. I think mm -hmm. when we just share studies and we don't work with people, you don't see, like it, it required me to work right. with people one-on-one -on -one, other than writing the book that I realized, oh, like my by, a book ideas of carnivore cure is very beneficial in an I ideological world. But mm -hmm. when it comes to real people in front of your face saying they're not feeling well, you can't go, well, I'm sorry, you still can't eat any carbs, right? <laughs> There's just this fine balance of figuring out, we're meeting people where they are and yes, trying to make exactly. them feel better. And that is a very fine balance. And you do not understand that unless you work one-on-one. -on -one. So that's where I always get punched in the face. Like my, I said about Mike Tyson. And so I have to be more flexible. It is, I think we are more dogmatic when we do not work one-on-one -on -one because it is the individuals that teach us that 100%, right? You can okay. tell a real coach. You can oh, meet, totally. when you meet a real coach because they understand nuance and the individuality of each person, if they're if they're stuck on one size fits all dogma, they're not coaching people. Oh, totally. They're not they're not in the they're not in the weeds with people because they aren't seeing like because a person a, a client someone with a health concern will challenge your ideology, and if <laughs> it will challenge your ideology <laughs> and what you think works, I I went through that myself. Went through that several times with with fasting workouts and intermittent fasting. I'm like, let's just clamp everybody down to this little. And it's like, until it, till I hit my own wall with it, I hit my own wall and realized, oh, I'm over leveraging all of these metabolic stressors and my cortisol's through the roof. And I may look good, but I feel terrible. And so, and, 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 and in dealing with people, it's like, yeah, a hundred percent with you. I can tell a real coach when they understand the nuance of taking ideas that make sense in ideal world and then molding them to fit as tools right. for that individual. One tool is great for a lawnmower. One tool doesn't work for a Ferrari. And okay. if you wanna, you wanna help someone be a Ferrari, you need a lot of tools and you need to know how to use them. I love so. it. I knew it because when I first asked the first questions, you're like, ooh, that really depends. And I'm like, okay, I can see that you work with people because normally it'll be this like, 
this is the answer. And I know that we want the answer online and we want it that like, just give me the magic pill. But just when you work with so many different people, you know, there is no magic pill. And I know that's like the ugly answer, but it is. It's ultimately, you have to find the answer that works for you. And I hope that our content and our interview makes people think like, do I want to take it or not? Or maybe I first need to fix this first and then maybe I'll consider it, but it's not off the table. I just want people to think and the thinking and then making the decision and then maybe working with you, working with me, but ultimately making that decision, not without blindly just going, okay, doctor said I need X, so I'm going to take X. And that's, like the yeah. ultimate goal of this, because again, working one-on-one -on -one, it's, there's no one answer. And I wish there was, it would make my life and your life easier. A lot easier. I just <laughs> write it on a blog, but totally. it's, it's strategy. It's individualized strategy that, that really comes down to it because each of us are on our own, our own, own journey. Right. And we are, we do all have some individuality. We all have a history, a physical history and genetics that all come together to make us who we are. And so who wants to be a clone? Well, we aren't clones in our solutions either. Right. And so, you know. I love it. Well, thank you so much again for joining me. This was a phenomenal conversation. And I and I learned a lot from you. And you made me think a lot about the way that even in our practice, when people are on, you know, bioidentical hormones, like what is our messaging with that? Because that is a question that we get often is, do you think it's a factor in why I'm not feeling well? Or do you think, and it's now, now we have a better, like, at least I have a better understanding of, you know, I need to also be super empathetic and knowing that there's a reason they got on it. It's because they either felt fatigued or tired or brain foggy or not well that, I mean, no one just gets on medicine for no reason, right? There's always mm -hmm. a reason and a better understanding that I think can go a long way. Thank you so much again for your time. Thank you, Judy. I appreciate the opportunity. Okay, guys, I hope you enjoyed this conversation. It gave me a lot of things to really think about. And as I write the second version of Carnivore Cure, I definitely will do a lot more stringent research and sort of give my thoughts for you in that second version. But until then, I still think that you should do your own research and in your own circumstance, think about what makes sense for you. I have not been at the point where I need to think about getting on exogenous bioidentical hormones or not, and I'm not there. So I don't know my answer for my own N equals one. I will say that in our carnivore community, our patients, we do see a handful of people on it and some people want to get off. And now I don't know what that intent is other than maybe that they fear that it can cause downstream effects, but ultimately you have to make your own decision. I hope that this conversation really gives you some things and tools to think about. And then I hope you go down your own rabbit holes to figure out are bioidentical hormones right for you. And if you feel good, if you've been on bioidentical hormones and you've benefited from them, or it has caused other negative downstream effects, I highly encourage you to put that in the comments because then you can see other people's N equals one stories. And then maybe that will support you in making other decisions with all of these hormones. I hope that if anything, it also tells you the importance of not drinking alcohol and eating sufficient protein daily, as well as the movement side and wanting to protect your bones and your lean mass so that you don't fall and never walk again. These are such important things. And as we age, we want to age gracefully and enjoy our lives as we are aging. Okay, guys, make sure to eat a lot of meat. Take care of your bodies because it is the only place you have to live. I will talk to you later. Bye guys.